Welcome and hello. This is a video lesson in Hi8. And in this lesson, we're going to be talking about crossing data. All right. So when I say crossing data, I'm referring to some of the data input required to define the crossing. And where that shows up in Hi8 is if we go ahead and add a culvert crossing, which you can also do by going up to culvert and add culvert crossing. The culvert crossing data we're going to be talking about in this lesson is the left half of this user interface. So we're talking about discharge data, tailwater data, and roadway data in this video. Over on the right half, I just wanted to point out we have culvert properties and culvert related data. We're going to be covering this in a later lesson. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with our crossing data. The crossing properties right here, we have a crossing name. So whatever the name is here is what it's going to show up in the Project Explorer over here. So let's just get started with some of our data entry. Also, this is coming from chapter three in the user's manual. If you are following along called crossing data, starting on page 35. OK, so as a quick introduction, here is that user's manual crossing data, page 35. And then this figure right here shows the difference between a single culvert barrel crossing and multiple culvert barrel crossing. So here's the single on the left. Here's the multiple on the right. It shows two, but there could be three, four, whatever, multiple culverts at a single crossing. This view right here is looking down on planet Earth. Perhaps we have a road that's going this way and then a river that's crossing under that roadway through a single culvert or a multiple culvert crossing. The figure below that shows a front view where we could have two different culvert barrels associated with the same crossing. OK, now it's time to talk about the discharge data. I'm not going to just read the user's manual. I like to demonstrate what the user's manual is talking about as we uh, look at the user interface. All right, so discharge data, that's the first of the three sections we're going to be talking about. And then the first field to define is the discharge method. We have three different options from a drop down. The first is min design max, and then there's user defined and recurrence. So whichever discharge method we select, that will affect the other data that's required for input. So user data, we just have to put in this discharge list for recurrence, also a discharge list. We need to define that. Or if we use min, design, and max, here we need to actually enter some data for flow rates in CFS pertaining to the minimum expected flow through that culvert crossing and then the design, and then a maximum. So I'm just making up numbers here, 0, 20, and 100. For this min design max discharge method, I8 will calculate performance curves for 10 equal discharge intervals between the minimum and the maximum discharge values. And then as for this design flow, it's also going to make a calculation at the design flow even if it doesn't happen to land on one of those equal discharge intervals between minimum and maximum. These performance curves that Hi8 calculates will later be used for the rating curve and further calculations. If you happen to have a specific range of interest, say between 15 and 25, you can set the min to 15 and then the max to say 25. And that creates a more narrow range of flow rates that will be calculated for the hydraulic calculations. So uh, we're going to go ahead and explore that a little bit more when we click on rating curve down here later in the video. But just uh, keep that in mind that we're defining the flows here and then the geometry here. The second discharge method is user defined. So if we select that, we'll click on the define button to define the discharge list. And up pops a dialog box here where we can specify the number, name, and flow rate in CFS. All right, so what I'm going to do here is instead of the number of flows set to two, that's the, the default value, I'm going to change that to 12 and then tab off. It now gives me 12 different rows. And what we need to do is input the float numbers in CFS in ascending order. So from lowest to highest, and you can type in numbers directly like uh, I'm doing right here, or you can paste data in from Excel. So I have an Excel file right here. I'm just going to Select these fields here, control C to copy, and then come back over here to my table, select and right click paste. OK, so that looks correct. What I'm doing is I'm giving names to specific flow rates, but not all the flow rates. 
and then I'm basically increasing the flow by 10 CFS saying, oops, I wanted this one to be designed. Okay, so control C, next control V will cut paste. That's cool. So I have a specific design 10 year and 100 year flow rate of interest I want calculated. So this user defined discharge method, I feel offers the most flexibility. I'm not sure what the maximum number of flow is, but it looks like it's going to handle 12 just fine. The user manual also mentions if you don't have any names in this names field, it will not show up in the reports or in the results. All right, so we'll click OK. Now the last discharge method uh, is recurrence. If you click recurrence and then click define, now we have a similar table as before, except now we have a fixed number of flows at nine that's grayed out and disabled. And then the names are also fixed at one year through 500 year return periods. So you can go ahead and just type in your numbers here and whatever they are, or you can paste them in. So I'm going to go ahead and paste in some numbers, which I just made up and I've copied those to my clipboard. Now I'm going to highlight the fields of the target fields. I want these to paste into right click paste and boom, here is my data. Not all return periods are required for flow volumes. You may just have the 10 year, 50 year and 100 year. And that means that all of the return periods in this table don't, don't have a flow rate associated with it. That's fine. They just won't be used for the calculations or the reports. All right, so we'll go ahead and click OK. And just because I want it to be min max, I'm going to change this back to what I had originally. Yeah, min max. Big note that we do have units of CFS. This particular project is using US customary units. So if I click OK and then just say ignore the errors, I can actually come back here to metric units. And if I switch that and then I go back to edit my culvert data, Notice that we now have the same values in CMS. So that conversion took place from CFS to CMS. And then all the other units are also metric in this dialog box. OK, I'm going to change it back to English units, though. So uh, bear with me here. US customary units is what it's called. And then culvert crossing data. And boom, here are my original values in the units of CFS. OK, uh, moving on to the next section, that's tail water data. This is used to calculate the tail water elevation for the different range of flow rates that we already defined. Our options here is channel type. This is the first selection, probably the first selection you should make, because whichever type that you select here will influence the other fields that you're going to input. This section of data is used to calculate the tail water rating curve downstream of the culvert crossing. Other than rectangular channel, the other options are trapezoidal, triangular, irregular, winter rating curve, and constant tailwater elevation. So I'm going to type in some numbers for rectangular channel, just numbers I'm making up off the top of my head. I'm going to type in 10 feet for the bottom width. The channel slope will be 0 0.025, so 2.5%. Manning's N is 0 0.035. And then I'm hitting the tab button to advance to the next field. So tab index has been worked into this software good to see channel invert elevation how about 150 feet and then finally once all this data is entered i can click on view to calculate the rating curve for this specific geometry and this specific range of flows so boom here is that data the far left column here has the range of flows from 15 to 25 there they are and it also has calculated fields for water surface elevation normal depth, velocity, and shear stress. Okay. I can also add, uh, click on the plot button here. And this is such a small range of flows. We're not really seeing any curvature, but we have the discharge or the flow rate across the horizontal axis and the water surface elevation on the vertical axis. I'm going to go ahead and just close that and then switch the range of flows to something a little bit larger so we can hopefully see some curvature. I'm going to click on view and then plot. And then, OK, that's better. So at a zero discharge, that's at water surface elevation 150. And then we have a little bit of a convex shape to our rating curve, which is what we would expect. All right, close that up. Here's the range from zero up to 100 with different numbers, but using the same geometry for this rectangular section. I'm not going to demonstrate trapezoidal. That just basically adds a side slope field and then triangular section that uses side slope but no base width because effectively the base width is zero. We also have irregular channel. 
So with a regular channel, that allows us, the users, to define the channel geometry if it's something that's not too close to a rectangular, a triangle, or a trapezoid. So click on the regular channel define button. Now we have a dialog box where we get to enter the channel slope as well as the number of cross section points, which is the number of rows in this table down here. So we'll say the channel slope is 1% this time, and then the number of cross section points is eight. So I'll tab off of that. I now have eight rows in this table for station, elevation, and Manning's end value. So this would typically be looking in the downstream direction, downstream of our culvert, where the station numbering should be increasing, and then the Manning's value and the elevation value would be whatever they are. The Manning's end value here represents the roughness between that station and the next station. Because notice there's no actual Manning's end value down here. So if you have X number of stations, you're going to have X minus one number of Manning end value to define for that cross section. Okay, I also have some data for here. I'm just going to copy and paste from Excel and then highlight the, the target fields and then right click and paste. Okay, so it looks like that data came in here. If we want to plot this cross section, we can do that by clicking on plot and I see what that cross section looks like. So very cool. I can zoom in on a certain area if I'm interested. And then with this checkbox, I can also add the Manning's end value on the right vertical axis, which is represented by these red lines here from 0.035 to 0.040. I believe the user's manual also mentions that I can copy data down. So if I wanted to copy this 0 0.04 Manning's end value over the existing 0 0.035 Manning's end value, I just grab on the lower right corner, wait, okay, something like that, and it, it copied down. So anyway, some of the interface tools feel like Excel, such as copy and paste and so on. If the irregular cross-section data that you define here cannot convey the range of discharges entered by the user, then the application will display an error message to tell you that the cross-section you've defined cannot convey the max flow and to make some sort of changes here. All right, so that is the user-defined cross-section. The other method is there is a enter the rating curve directly. So if you do that, you need to specify the channel invert elevation. That would be for the tailwater end, of course, tailwater data. Then click define. And then for the range of flow rates, in this table, you can specify the elevation and the velocity. I don't have any data pre uh, prepared for that, but that's how you would do it. And then the last option for tailwater data is constant. So enter a constant tailwater elevation, and then you'd put in the channel invert elevation and the channel tailwater elevation. You may use the constant tailwater elevation to represent the design elevation of a lake, bay, or estuary into which the culvert or culverts discharge. All right, the last section for our crossing properties data, crossing data, is the roadway data. Our two different options is constant roadway elevation, in which case we'd have to fill out this data. Otherwise, we would select on the irregular, where we defined the shape with this button right here. Either way, we also need to specify the surface and the top width. So let's start with constant road elevation. The user's manual has this diagram here to demonstrate the length and the width to be a front view and a plan view. So I'm going to just type in some numbers here. The first state a roadway station right here is not required. And if you don't add anything in here, the default value will be zero. So we'll just type in zero. That way the stationing number can be added to the culverts when uh, displayed in a plot. The crest length, I'm going to say that is 200. The crest elevation I'll say is 160. And then the top width I will say is 80. Oops. I'm sorry, 80 right here. Okay, there we go. The crest width of 200, that's somewhat arbitrary. It just needs to be sufficiently large to cover the length of the cross section and the culvert. And then the top width right here, this includes travel lanes, medians, and shoulders. So it's not just the travel lane itself. It would be the, the entire embankment. And if we happen to use an irregular roadway profile shape, we would select irregular. We would define that geometry by clicking on the find button. And then we have between three and apparently 5,000 different uh, data points we can enter for station and elevation data. I don't have any data prepared for that, but this is where you would enter that data with the option to plot it. Okay. 
Our options for roadway surface is paved gravel and then input discharge coefficient. If you want to insert a discharge coefficient there, that's how you would do it. So I'm going to change that back to paved. And that's it for our crossing data lesson. In chapter three, in high eight, we talked about the discharge data, the tailwater data, and roadway data.